Please join me in welcoming to Distinctive Voices, Dr. Henry Klausman. Well, thanks, Miguel. And uh, I want to thank the audience not only for that rousing uh, uh, applause, but also for coming in under these horrible conditions. I really didn't expect anybody to show up, uh, but here you are. Um, so you must be really motivated to hear about this interesting topic. And uh, I'm going to um, do my best to make a very complex subject as comprehensible as I can. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing the eyeball, then I'll move on to the retina, then I'll talk a little bit about retinal degeneration, and then we'll move right into stem cells, and then I'll apply stem cells to retinal degeneration and show you give or take about how close we are at this point in terms of coming towards a therapy. So here's the eye. Um, you probably remember this from high school biology. Um, and so we know the light comes in the pupil here, but where, where the heck's the retina? The retina is on the back of the eye. So it's analogous to the film in the camera. It has to be in the back um, and it, where the light and the image are projected onto when you look at something. Um, so the retina is back here where it's orange, but the orange color isn't the retina. The retina is actually clear. So it's one of these interesting paradoxes that although the retina can see, you can't really see the retina. Um, but we know where it is because we can see these blood vessels that supply the retina with blood uh, that are not clear because of the red blood inside of them. Um, but looking back here, we would be looking through the retina towards the tissue underneath, and I'll talk about that next. Uh, one other point to make, I'm going to make a big distinction throughout the talk uh, between the macula, which is the center of vision, and the periphery of the retina, which is everything else. Okay, so here's the retina. Light comes in here through the eye. We're focused on the back of the eye now. And it goes through the transparent retina, strikes these photoreceptors, and that triggers a neural impulse that goes back to the brain, as this little uh, cartoon illustrates. Okay. So photoreceptors are a type of brain cell, basically, that's specialized for detecting light, which is something different from any other type of brain cell. So that's the business end of the retina. And there's two types of photoreceptors, and you probably remember this too. There's the rods and the cones. The rods are specialized for night vision, and by that we mean really dark vision when there's no moon. Um, and they're illustrated in black in this uh, cartoon here. The cones are a different type of photoreceptor, and they can be further classified into red, green, and blue cones, as illustrated here. And these are the photoreceptors that detect the color. They're used for near vision. They distinguish faces. They do a lot of the heavy work uh, that we're all familiar with when we think about vision. And then deep to that is an outer pigmented layer that not everybody's heard about. That's this retinal pigment epithelium here, or RPE. And that's a layer that lays deep to the, the retina, nourishes the photoreceptors, so it's very important. The photoreceptors depend on this RPE layer. Um, it's also black and pigmented, and that keeps the stray light from bouncing around and blurring your image. The RPE layer sits on a very fine membrane that you can't even see, known as Brooks membrane. I bring that up because it's really important for one of the degenerative diseases that I'm going to talk about. So that's basically your retina. Now, once the light is detected, it has to get transmitted to the brain, and it does through that through these connecting cells here, known as bipolar cells. Then you have retinal ganglion cells on the very inside of the retina. And these have connections that go all the way back to the brain. So it has very long axonal projection. So, 
So now I'm going to get back to this concept of the macula versus the periphery. So we've seen some of the cellular detail of the retina. Now there's some basic kind of geographical differences between different parts of the retina. Again, there's the macula smack in the middle in the back, and then there's everything else, which we call periphery. Um, the macula is for your high acuity vision, like I said. You use it to recognize faces, to read something. Uh, that's why they have the letter here. Or for driving, to read the signs, to read your dash panel, and so on, to, to distinguish cars. But the periphery is important for context, motion, and also, of course, for dark vision at night. It's, so that means it's important for orienting yourself to your surround, for navigating through a complex scene, and for seeing objects that appear out of nowhere, moving objects to avoid those. And that means it's also important in driving, too. If you just have central vision and you can't see something coming from the side, that's going to be uh, a problem. Um, and why are these two parts of the retina, why do they work so differently? Well, it depends a lot on the photoreceptors that are in those parts of the retina. So what we have here is a graph. And it's a, a look across this retina, starting in the middle, which is here, and then moving to the edge on either side, this way. And we're just counting the two types of photoreceptors. The dark photoreceptors are the cones. And you'll see that the cones have a very different distribution than the uh, lighter colored photoreceptors, the rods. Very different. Let me go through that for you. In the center, we have cones. We have lots of cones. They're all packed into the center. There's cones across the whole retina, but they get very thin the moment you leave the central retinal area. That's the macula. So the macula is dominated by cones. And the center of the macula, known as the fovea, is completely cone. There are no rods there at all. But then as soon as you move away from the central fovea, you start to get rods and lots of them. And you can see that most of the photoreceptors in the retina are actually rods. But they're just not in the center. They're more on the side. The fact is, though, 99% of the time, you're doing all you're seeing with these cones. But these rods are very important late at night. Now, the reason I bring this up is because the degenerations we're going to talk about, some of them start by going after the rods, and some of them start with the cone. So because of that, they're going to have very different symptoms. So here we're going to talk about the retinal degeneration. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a uh, cartoon that shows the degeneration process, so we're just going to have to live with the repeat of uh, our original one. Um, but this will hopefully help orient you to what I'm talking about on this side. So what I'm going to, the, the degenerations I'm going to concentrate on are the photoreceptor degenerations. There are other types of retinal degeneration, but this is what I'm going to talk about. And these come in two main groups, the hereditary degeneration and the age-related. The hereditary typically, but not invariably, starts by a loss of the rod photoreceptors. Um, and then with progression, it can affect the cones and the RPE layer as a matter of course, a kind of domino effect, if you will. Um, and the classic example is known as retinitis pigmentosa, and that's the one I'm going to talk about in this category. There are other conditions with other names, typically named after whoever uh, discovered it, such as Stargardt's disease, Best's disease, Usher's disease, and so on, um, uh, just in case you've heard of any of those. Um, then, on the other hand, we have the age-related degenerations. These typically start in that invisible layer I talked about, Brooks membrane, that's way in the back. And then they progress through the RPE and then eventually affect these photoreceptors, um, which is when the problem really shows up. Um, so the classic example here is macular degeneration, or AMD. This is important because it's not a rare disease. And 
Almost everybody in the room probably knows somebody who has it. It comes in two main types called wet and dry, and I will explain a little bit about what that means. Um, and then to get back to that topic, we have other types of neuronal loss in the retina. For instance, optic nerve degenerations can affect these ganglion cells on the inner side of the retina, leaving the photoreceptors alone. So in a condition like glaucoma, your photoreceptors might be perfectly fine, but now your visual problem is because this link in the chain at the output end is um, disrupted. But we're not going to talk about that today. Although um, some of the strategies we're looking into may apply to those kind of conditions as well. So to get into retinitis pigmentosa, again, this is a hereditary condition. Um, people inherit this much the way you inherit either blue eyes or brown eyes or green eyes. Um, and people in, with a family history, they may have a family history where they know their grandfather had it and their uncle had it and so on. Um, or they may not have any family history. And the reason for that is there's many different genetic variations. Um, people with a dominant type of mutation, it gets passed along and shows up in each person who carries that gene. If it's a recessive gene, it can hide in the background and then just pop out unexpectedly. Um, and in addition, sometimes a new mutation occurs and somebody uh, develops it for the first time in a family tree. Um, but from then, they can pass it on. So like I say, it's caused by a single change in the DNA. Just one little base pair gets flipped around and that's it. Um, but it's not the same base pair each time. There are well over 100 different mutations that have been identified that all result in a very similar picture. Um, typically, these involve genes that are expressed in the photoreceptors, and that means these are proteins that the photoreceptor needs in order to do its job of detecting light. And uh, most commonly, it's the very most important protein, and that's rhodopsin. You may have heard about that. Rhodopsin is the actual protein that detects the light. It's the first one in the rod. So when that photon comes into the eye, it's the rhodopsin that detects it. Then there are other proteins in the rod that respond after the rhodopsin. So it's like a little uh, Rube Goldberg device, if you will. But the first thing that gets triggered is the rhodopsin. That's the initial switch. And then there's an ongoing cascade of molecular events that signal it to the other end of the rod. Then it goes to the other cells and off to the brain and so on and so forth. But that very first protein in the sequence of detecting light is affected in this disease. Um, and and the, this uh, protein's only expressed in the rod photoreceptors. For instance, the cells of your skin or your spleen or your liver don't express rhodopsin. They have no reason to. They're not, they're, they're not in the business of seeing or detecting light that way. Now, the cones also have opsin protein, similar proteins, but they're not exactly the same. And that's why they can see different types of light. So the rhodopsin's tuned to see the very dim light, the, um, the green, red opsins detect the different colors, and that's why you can see the different colors. Now, for some reason, when somebody has these particular mutations in their rhodopsin gene, the rod photoreceptors die. They don't die immediately. That mutation doesn't kill them outright, but it initiates some kind of mysterious cascade that eventually makes the cell die. Um, this takes time, but eventually, because every rod has the same mutation in it, all the rods eventually die. Now, this um, gives the, the person a sense of night blindness, and that's usually how they present to the physician. Um, and when the physician takes a look, they see these, um, these pigmentary changes in the back of the eye, hence the name retinitis pigmentosa. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. The rods have died. Um, and then the cones, which don't have the same mutation because they have different opsin in them, 
they're functioning just fine, but for some reason, without the rods next to them, they slowly lose their ability to sustain themselves, and then the cones can start to die. When this happens, you start to get tunnel vision and eventually total blindness if all the cones have died. So this is a really devastating kind of condition, and currently there's no cure available. Now here's what the, the uh, ophthalmologist sees. On the left, you see a normal fundus. So this is the retina viewed through an ophthalmoscope. So just take a good look. The yellowish round uh, object is the optic nerve. You see the blood vessels in red. These are normal blood vessels that are supplying blood to the retina. And right in the middle, you see a dimple of sorts, and that's the macula with the fovea right in the middle. And that's your area of uh, high acuity vision. Now, retinitis pigmentosa on the left is unmistakably different from the normal retina, correct? And the first thing you notice is all that pigment. That's the pigmentosa in the condition. Um, if you look closely, you'll also notice that the central vision, the macula in the middle, is relatively spared compared to all this pig pigment havoc going on around it. And that's just consistent with what I told you. The mutation affects the rods, the rods die first, and the cones are spared until later in the disease. Meanwhile, um, you can see that the optic nerve looks a little more pale, and the blood vessels, they're very much constricted compared to the normal blood vessels on the other side. All signs that this retina is getting uh, slowly uh, degenerating. And what the patient sees is schematically indicated down below. First you have a normal view, then you lose your rod vision and your peripheral cones, and you get this tunnel vision. And then if the macular cones are all lost, you end up uh, in a very unfortunate condition. Now here I'm going to talk about age-related macular degeneration. So this is a completely different degeneration. This one's not hereditary, it's age-related. Um, some patients start to develop problems in their 50s, but most people with this condition are older, and it gets progressively more likely as you age. Um, it can run in families to a certain extent, but that doesn't mean it's hereditary like blue eyes, brown eyes. Um, the genetics are being understood as we speak, um, but they they relate to susceptibility. In other words, it's more like a lottery ticket. Are you likely to get the problem or not? And that means you could have the susceptibility genes and not get the condition. You could not have the susceptibility genes and get it anyway. It's just a matter of odds. Um, so it's more a probabilistic thing. One thing is that Caucasians are at higher risk, um, but as people look into this problem more, they realize that no group is really immune from this problem. It just manifests in different ways on different genetic backgrounds. So it, it looks a little different in different types of people, but um, the end result tends to be the same. There are some modifiable risk factors, um, very much related to what's true for heart disease, both smoking and obesity uh, do predispose to a worse outcome. And then to get into the subtypes you may have heard of, the wet and the dry. I'll start with the dry, which is a little more common. Uh, this involves these uh, drusen, which is a German term for these uh, pale flecks that you see in the macula in the upper slide there. Um, so that's what we call drusen. And they're debris. They're microscopic debris particles that are starting to collect on that Brooks membrane I mentioned, that's the deepest layer, very thin, way deep to the retina. So these drusen start to accumulate. The patient may not even know about it. This is not really AMD yet. This is kind of like the prototypical phase. But this does mean you're at increased risk for it. Um, now, the patient may not see it, but when the ophthalmologist looks in there, it's very obvious. So he can tell you, okay, you have some drusen. And if anybody's heard that, then this is what they're talking about. 
Now, with time, some patients with drusen will start to have problems with the RPE layer that's on top of the drusen. So these little deposits of debris can start to lead to local degeneration of the RPE layer. It doesn't always happen. In fact, most of the time it probably doesn't happen, but it can happen. Um, and as the RPE atrophies, remember the RPE layer is important for nourishing the photoreceptors. So with the RPE slowly disappearing, the photoreceptors eventually get into trouble. And they get into trouble right in the center of your vision in the macula, hence macular degeneration. Um, so that involves the loss of cones. And that's where the, that's, that's when it becomes symptomatic. Now I just described the dry form. What about this wet form? Well, the wet form also starts with a problem in Brooks' membrane. Um, but in this case, it's not just a thickening and a, a bunch of little deposits forming. There's an actual rupture or break in Brooks' membrane. Now, that's a big problem because this Brooks' membrane is the, the thin line that's protecting your retina from all the blood vessels on the other side. And as soon as there's a hole in Brooks' membrane, abnormal blood vessels start to crawl through that hole and they start to form these um, fronds of uh, abnormal blood vessels underneath the retina. Now, what's bad about that? Well, the first thing is that having something under your retina means the retina is tented up. So that means the film in your camera has got a, a, a crease in it, so your image is going to be distorted. But don't stop there. These blood vessels are abnormal. That means they don't have the normal capacity to, of retinal blood vessels to keep the blood inside of them. They start leaking blood and fluid, and this starts to collect under the retina as well, as you see illustrated in the uh, cartoon in the lower right. So you see this blood and serum components starting to accumulate under the retina. Blood is actually toxic to photoreceptors. So this is why wet AMD is worse than dry. I mean, the end result's similar, but the progression's more rapid and more destructive because of this blood. And here, we're taking a look into the eyes of actual patients just to show you what this really looks like. On the left, we have the dry condition. You see all these flecks all over the back of the eye. These are the drusen. Those are benign, but they're a sign that there could be trouble. Now, in the middle, you'll notice the drusen are missing. Well, that's actually a bad sign because that means the retina is actually degenerated there, and that's turned into dry AMD. So this patient has actual degeneration in their macula. You can't really see it, but you can notice that the drusen are missing. Um, on the other side, we have somebody with wet AMD, and you can see the blood. Um, the blood looks discolored and so on because you're looking deep to the retina. You're looking through the retina and seeing these old accumulations and newer accumulations of blood under there. The uh, actual blood vessel problem is right in the middle, so that's the part that looks like it's okay, but it's not a long way from okay in this case. And down below, we see an example of what a patient with this condition would typically see. First, the, the normal view, and then you see right in the middle, right where you, your facial recognition is, you start to lose um, resolution right there. Um, typically, AMD spares the periphery, so that's the one piece of good news. This doesn't necessarily spread to the rest of the retina the way uh, retinitis pigmentosa does. It typically affects the macula, and then it just stops. And um, AMD, just to go over this, you're, you're likely to hear about it if you haven't already, uh, once you get in the outside world. This is uh, not a rare disease at all, and it's increasing in prevalence as the population in all the Western countries ages. And that's true in the U.S. It's also true in Europe, Japan, and so on. Um, and it's estimated that uh, 10 million people in the U.S. either have AMD or, or early signs that could put them at risk for it. Um, and dry AMD, the first type, is by far the more prevalent with accounts for 9 out of 10 people with this condition. 
Now, you might have heard of some of the new treatments being offered for AMD. This has been a big uh, source of uh, triumph for the medical community. These include such compounds as Lucentis and Avastin. Within the context of AMD, you should realize that these are just aimed at the wet version. And what they do is they target those abnormal blood vessels and block them from growing. And they do a really great job. So this is like a molecular triumph where an antibody fragment is designed to shortcut the, the growth factors that promote these blood vessels and just knocks them out. Well, that's great. The problem is that it doesn't work for dry AMD. And then in wet AMD, um, if the photoreceptors have already taken a hit, there's nothing that these medications can do to bring them back. So that brings us closer to what I'm talking about, actual efforts to, to reconstruct the retina or to halt the progression of photoreceptor loss. So if we're going to try and repair the retina, which is not at all an easy task, um, Right now, technology provides us with a couple of uh, nice tool sets to, to consider using. Um, I'll just classify these into two large groups. One is advanced drug delivery. That means instead of taking a pill or injecting something into your eye or injecting something into your veins, we're going to try and get the, the, uh, the pharmaceutical agent directly into the vitreous in a sustained manner so you don't have to keep getting injections and so on. Um, so the idea is sustained delivery through implantable biodegradable delivery systems. Now these could be biodegradable polymers, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit, or you could use genetically engineered stem cells or stem cells that have drug-like properties. And in that case, the stem cell isn't so much rebuilding the retina as it is just being a delivery boy. It's bringing the good stuff into the eye. And the nice thing about using a stem cell, it can just keep producing some of these compounds so it can keep delivering them on and on so you don't have to keep getting injected. Um, on the other hand, um, in patients where the photoreceptors are entirely gone, we would like to be able to replace those cells that does sound like a heroic task, but I'm going to show you some data that indicates that in rodents and pigs um, and even cats, we have some uh, rather remarkable findings there that give us quite a bit of hope. That's not to say there isn't a huge amount of work left to do, but uh, I'll show you and you can judge for yourself. So a lot of the work I'm going to show you involves just the transplantation of stem cells, but in addition, I'm going to introduce a topic called tissue engineering, and that's where we do stem cells with a twist. We, we use some of these fancy new biodegradable polymers to, to create a more sophisticated delivery system that hopefully improves our results, and I'm going to show you some of that as well. But you can see by my highlighting that of these two types of strategies, um, Stem cells are typically involved, and that's why they're very central to what we're doing in the lab. So what are stem cells? Um, I think it's worth backing up a moment and just describing what makes a stem cell so interesting. What is it? How do we define it? Well, a stem cell has to have two very fundamental properties. One is self-renewal, and the other is the generation of mature cells. Now, self-renewal, in turn, uh, requires two processes to happen. One is the cell has to be able to divide to make more cells. And in addition, one of the cells it makes, as you see in the cartoon, at least one of the cells has to be another stem cell. Both of them could be another stem cell, but at least one of them for self-renewal requires that it's a stem cell. So you see from that little diagram, you start with a stem cell in yellow, it divides. One of the daughter cells is a stem cell in yellow, which can in turn go back and divide again. So self-renewal is satisfied. 
The other point is to generate mature cells. For instance, we're not made out of stem cells. We're made out of blood, brain, bone, heart, liver, and so on, all these mature tissues. So the cell, when it divides, has to also be able to make mature cell types that build up the body. Um, when you satisfy both of these properties, you have something that starts to look a lot like a stem cell. And certainly, true stem cells exhibit both of these properties. But there isn't just one type of stem cell. And this is very bewildering to the public when they hear reports about stem cells are from the umbilical cord, and stem cells are from the embryo, and stem cells are from the fat. Well, um, I just want to uh, clarify that a little bit. First off, embryonic stem cells. These are ES cells. They're the ones from the early embryo. These are the ones that the big political debate was about. Um, those are the closest thing to a true stem cell. They fit all the criteria of a stem cell. They also have the most power in terms of generating the most variety of different tissue types. So that's why people like those cells. Um, more recently, there's been some very exciting news out of Japan. This came out uh, in 2007. Uh, Professor Yamanaka discovered, uh, quite to everybody's surprise, that if you use uh, enough genetic engineering, you can actually convince a skin fibroblast to become something that looks for all the world like an embryonic stem cell. Well, the excitement there was that, wow, maybe we don't have to get into this ethical thing about breaking up embryos. If we can just take somebody's skin and turn it into embryonic stem cell, you could have a custom embryonic stem cell for yourself. Um, but of course, that's a theoretical thing. There's a lot of challenges involved, but I think that's a really great breakthrough. Um, and I just wanted to introduce what we call the IPS cell. That's what we're talking about. That means going from a mature cell backwards in time to become an embryonic stem cell. Then there's these adult stem cells. And for practical purposes, you can kind of lump everything that's not an embryonic stem cell into an adult stem cell. These are tissue specific. So they don't make every kind of tissue. They make whatever tissue they're found in. So this is part of the way embryonic stem cells divvy up labor during development of the organism. In other words, the, the embryonic stem cell is going to say, OK, now I'm going to make a bunch of tissue-specific stem cells, and those cells will make the liver, and this one's over here will be heart stem cells. I'll make the heart, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of how it works. Um, and these are found in a broad range. And some of those are cells that make blood. And those are found in the bone marrow, and they're also found in very high concentrations in the umbilical cord blood. So that's why you heard about that. The umbilical cord bloods are not embryonic stem cells. They're a potent type of cord blood, uh, of blood stem cell, if you will. They're like a bone marrow cell. So they can make all the blood types. There's more controversy as to whether they can do more than that. But I think. Any of these adult stem cells are focused on the tissue they're trying to make. That, but Professor Yamanaka's breakthrough indicates that any cell that has a nucleus can be kicked back into embryonic stem cell. Then I think we can say that we're on an open, moving playing field here in terms of stem cells. But in the simplest sense, a tissue-specific stem cell makes the tissue it's in. So here's a little trip down human development. You start with a fertilized egg. Well, that's really the most potent stem cell there is. It is a stem cell. Why? Because it can divide, make more, and it can differentiate into an entire human being and a placenta to boot. So that's what we call a totipotent stem cell. And then as it divides, it becomes a blastocyst. That's the little ball of cells um, over in the upper right of this diagram, that's where you find the embryonic stem cell. So it doesn't look like an organism yet. It's a little ball of cells. And when you take that lower part called the inner cell mass and you move it into a dish and you do the right tricks, these cells can become 
embryonic stem cells. Now, if instead of taking cells, you just let the organism develop, um, eventually, as the organism starts to make these different tissues, you see the different tissues labeled there, you're going to have these tissue-specific stem cells. And I just show you some examples of what these look like growing in a dish over on the right side. In the upper right, you got embryonic stem cells. Um, what you see, this large round thing, is actually a colony packed with individual ES cells. They're like tiny marbles within that colony. Down below, you can see the cells maybe a little more clearly. Those are my favorite. Those are the retinal progenitor cells, and that's what I'm working with. Um, and these are spreading out in the dish and, and making these kind of networks, but there are individual cells in there if you look hard enough. Now, the, em the embryonic stem cells can make any cell in the body, whereas the retinal cells make retinal cells when they differentiate. So uh, if embryonic stem cells can do everything, why would we ever consider using an adult stem cell in the first place? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is um, because of the bone marrow cells, we know that um, these, those kind of adult stem cells can actually be useful in a clinical setting. In other words, it's not theoretical whether you can use stem cells to treat human beings or not because it's already being done with bone marrow stem cells. And that includes the umbilical cells being used to um, replenish the bone marrow. So that whole field of bone marrow transplantation that was around in the 80s is gone because now it's all bone marrow stem cell transplantation, which has much better results and much lower mortality, and it's the standard of care. So that's one example of stem cells doing a great job and already in practice. Um, in addition, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, less impediments for doing adult cells. There's um, a lot less objections from various groups and so on. Um, in some ways, they're simpler and safer because if you think about it, embryonic stem cell has all this power, but it, it needs a lot of direction to go from being this embryonic stem cell to being a tissue cell, uh, whereas the tissue-specific stem cells are already going down that path. So they're closer to where you want to be. They're more likely to give you the result you want. So in a lot of ways, the older the stem cell, the better it behaves, and that's why we like them. So in terms of stem cells in the eye, again, I want to back up a little bit because you might hear some things that are confusing again because there's more than one stem cell application in the eye. Um, and at first I want to talk about the limbal stem cell. And this is one that's actually found its way into clinical application already. Um, the limbus is uh, the part of the eye that's at the edge of the cornea. So if you look at the white of the eye on this uh, example here, and you look where the blue meets the white, that's what we call the limbus. So the, limbus, uh, the limbal stem cells are in the white area near to the blue and they repopulate the top layer of the cornea. So if you've ever had your eye scraped, and I know I have, uh, it's very painful for a few days, and maybe the doctor puts a patch over it, and then in a few days later, you're blinking and everything's fine again. What happened? Well, the limbal stem cells started dividing, and they grew a new epithelium over the front of your cornea, and it's completely repaired. So that's what they're there for. It's a very specific job. It, these cells aren't there to replace your kidneys or your liver or anything else. They're just there to repair the corneal epithelium, but they do a great job. And in patients where there are no limbal stem cells, for instance, alkali burns or something, your cornea is going to be in big, big trouble. So you really need this technology for transplanting limbal stem cells so that the patient's cornea stays moist and, and clear and the patient can see. Um, other types of stem cells have been tried experimentally in the eye, for instance, the embryonic and iPS cells. Also, something called a mesenchymal stem cell you might come across. There's neural stem cells that are like retinal stem cells, only they're from the brain. And then there's these retinal progenitor cells that I'm talking about. So, like I said, everything's experimental except for the limbal. 
Now, how to repair the retina with retinal progenitor cells? Um, we derive these cells from the developing retina. That means they're immature cells. They haven't matured yet. They're not embryonic anymore, but neither are they mature. They're like stem cells, except there's this caveat, and that is that the self-renewal part of being a stem cell, that ends automatically with these cells. So you can only grow them for a while, and then they stop dividing. And that may be why the retina stops repairing itself uh, as we get older. For instance, if you look at a, a fish or an amphibian, you can actually damage their retina and it'll grow back, believe it or not. You can actually take out part of their brain and it'll grow back. We can't do that. Um, our retina can probably repair itself as an embryo up to a point, and then it loses that capacity. So retinal progenitor cells are highly regulated and they stop dividing, uh, and, and that means um, that that's actually kind of a safety feature if you're going to transplant these because the only way to get a tumor is if the cells continue to divide and divide and divide. Any cell that stops dividing is, has a built-in safety factor, and we like that. So these cells can be transplanted, as I'll show you shortly. And when uh, they're transplanted, they can migrate in the tissue, find the position where they want to integrate, and then differentiate into the mature retinal cell types, and I'll show you examples of that. Now, where do we get these fluorescent stem cells, and why do we want to use fluorescent cells? Well, we're not using fluorescent cells for humans. Remember, these are animal studies, but the reason we're interested in fluorescent stem cells is because we want to find the cells after we transplant them. And these little shapeshifters can easily disguise themselves as normal cells because that's what they turn into. And so the only way to figure out what your transplant did is to tag it in some way so you can identify it after the fact. And I'll show you just how this works. Um, but to do this, we get animals that have been transgenically modified with a jellyfish protein that's fluorescent. If you've been to the aquarium, you know that jellyfish are fluorescent under UV light. And that's, that gene has been modified to make it glow in different types of colors. And in fact, you can get fluorescent mice in all the colors of the rainbow now. There is a green pig or several of these and uh, even a red cat. So here's an example of retinal progenitor cells being derived from a green mouse. You can see that the mouse is fluorescent. You take the retinal tissue and you grow it in the dish and you can see in successive days that these cells are growing into little balls. That's evidence of self-renewal that I was talking about. They respond to growth factor by proliferating. And then we can do molecular analysis, and we see that at the molecular level, these cells are, have all the little molecules inside them that we know are involved in building up the retina. So they seem to be the right cells for the job. Here's some examples of what happens when you transplant fluorescent green retinal progenitor cells in a rodent. These cells migrate into the retina and take up position and you don't see the retina, but you just see the transplanted cells because they're the ones tagged with the green fluorescent protein. But I can assure you that these cells are looking a lot like normal retinal cells. The ones on the left are bipolar cells. The one in the middle looks just like a rod photoreceptor in a mouse. And on the right is a cluster of these rod photoreceptors. So these cells, if you didn't know they were from a stem cell, you would think they were normal cells. Well, they integrate into the retina, but does it do any functional benefit for the host animal? Um, this is a running wheel test. I don't want to go through it in too much detail, but I'll just give you an idea how scientists use little tricks to try and get answers to questions. The question of can a mouse see better or not is a hard one to answer because you can't get it to read the eye chart, right? So what do you do? Well, anybody who's had a hamster knows that those little guys love to run at night on their running wheel, and they'll keep you awake all night. If you go into the room and flip the light on, what happens? They just sit there all innocent. Yeah. 
I wasn't doing anything. And then you turn it off and go back to bed, they start right back up again. Well, we take advantage of this phenomenon by hooking up the running wheel and the light to a computer. And so the computer can put on a light of different levels of brightness or darkness and assay the animal in terms of can it see the light or not, just by whether it stops running or just keeps on running because it can't see the light anymore. And that's how we discriminate uh, uh, which of our animals can see better. So in this particular example, we take positive and negative controls, which means we have blind mice who get a sham treatment. We get blind mice that get the stem cell treatment. And we, get, we compare them to mice who are, can see normally. And then we see that the, actually what, we, what happened is at different light levels, we saw that the transplanted animals were performing better than the sham controls, suggesting or showing that they, they actually could see better. Um, now this is evidence for at least visual preservation. It doesn't tell you why the animals see better. In other words, it doesn't tell you if they're using the new photoreceptor that you put in there or whether the photoreceptor you put in there is just helping the photoreceptors that were already there. But the way we look at it, any result's a good result. If the animal's happy, we're happy too. We would like to know whether these implanted photoreceptors can actually work, however, because that would be a pretty big deal. And uh, about a year ago, a paper was published uh, from Tom Ray's lab at the University of Washington where he showed that transplanted stem cells that turned into photoreceptors actually did contribute visual ability to a retina that couldn't otherwise see. He did this by transplanting into mice that were completely blind and had no photoreceptors at all. And the transplanted ones improved their ability on a number of different tests of visual function. So that's really good news. So it looks like these cells really are wiring into the visual system and really can deliver light information to the retina. Now something I just need to touch on is the transplant immunology. This is something that puts people to sleep faster than anything I know. But um, if you were getting a stem cell transplant, you would really want to know whether you have to be on immune suppression with cyclosporin or not. For instance, if you're getting a heart transplant, um, I remember when Christian Barnard was doing the first heart transplants, he was able to get a perfectly beating heart in a patient. That was great. But then a couple weeks later, the guy was always dead. And they figured out there was immune rejection of the heart. So then they started using um, cyclosporin, this drug that downregulates your immune system. And then you could get um, organ transplants to take. And that led, it was the immunosuppressive drugs that really led to the boon in, in kidney, heart, and liver transplantation that we've all seen for the last few decades. Well, it turns out that's great, but immune downregulation isn't so great because it's a lot like AIDS, if you want to look at it that way. It's not contagious, but it does squish your immune system down and makes you susceptible to diseases and cancer and a lot of bad things. Um, so wouldn't it be great if these cells didn't need immune suppression? Well, it turns out when you transplant a cornea to the front of the eye, um, you don't routinely have to immunosuppress the patient. It turns out the eye has this characteristic where it's, it's an immune privileged site. So you can put a tissue in there and normally it's not rejected. Now it can be rejected, but normally it isn't and normally we don't have to immunosuppress people. That means the surgery is much safer in terms of the collateral risk of immune suppression. Well, when we looked at these cells, we found out that these cells are actually not rejected in mice even if we put them outside of the eye. Remember, the eye protects them. We could put them under the kidney capsule and they still weren't rejected. So these are kind of super cells. They don't need uh, help from cyclosporin. They evade the immune system on their own. Now that's the results of mice. And of critical interest is whether this applies to other animals and humans because if that's the case in humans, it really lowers the bar towards moving this towards the clinic because the patients won't be at nearly as much risk 
if you don't have to systemically lower their immunity. So moving on into the pigs, we got the same kind of retinal progenitor cells growing from retinal tissue from the pig. Um, and because they were a green pig, the cells are green too. We do our usual molecular analysis to make sure these are the cells we thought they were. And then we transplant them into the eye. And in this case, we see the photoreceptor development. And we see that the cells are expressing rhodopsin in red and another photoreceptor marker called recoverin in blue. Um, and so this is evidence that even outside of mice, these retinal progenitor cells are able to make a photoreceptor cell. So that's promising because we're always worried that something we find in a mouse is going to stay in the mouse and never translate to anybody else, which is very frustrating. And once again, we did not immunosuppress these pigs, and the cells survived anyway. So again, it looks like retinal progenitor cells can make photoreceptors, and they don't need immune suppression. What about cats? Here's the red cat that was developed in South Korea. They look very devilish under UV light, I can guarantee it. And they do love to scratch. Now, here are some red cat retinal progenitor cells. You do the same molecular analysis to verify that they are um, progenitor cells. And then we transplant them to a type of blind cat. There's a, a special breed of Abyssinian cat. In fact, there are several of them. These cats are interesting. They've probably been around since ancient Egypt. If you see those cat mummies from the pharaohs, they look a lot like an Abyssinian cat. Uh, Abyssinian cats are thought to be the oldest breed of cat. And when they looked at Siamese cats, they've actually identified that the same mutation that makes the Abyssinian cat go blind is found in a completely different type of cat from the other side of uh, the Asian continent. So I'd be interested in testing some of these cat mummies to see if they have this mutation. And maybe this mutation that leads to blind cats has been around for, for millennia. But um, now we're finally at the point where maybe we can do something about it. So we've been transplanting cat cells to the cat retina um, and again, in these cases, you see green cells, and they're turning into various types of retinal cells after transplantation. And here's some data hot off the press with the red cat cells. And I think you can easily figure out which cells are from the red cat. Now, they're transplanted at the top, at that area that's green where the photoreceptors are. And you can see that they've migrated down into the retina. So that gives you a very strong idea of how capable these kind of cells are at migrating through tissue. Now, the reason they migrated here is that's the area where the injection was. So they're trying to repair that wound. Uh, meanwhile, if you look at the red area that's more uh, overlapping with the green, I think you'll see some vertical red. Um, this uh, pointer's a little dead, or it's recharged. So that looks like it could be a photoreceptor, and this, and this, and this. I think uh, these cells are starting to make photoreceptors in the cat. They didn't co-label with the rhodopsin in green, but these cells had only been in there a few days. So they probably didn't have time to upregulate, turn on this rhodopsin gene. Anyway, very promising. Um, and we're looking forward to getting some functional data as well, which was, that was one of the big attractions for working with cats. Uh, they're able to see. And here's another cell. It looks like a very beautiful example of Mueller cell, which is a supporting cell that's normally present in the retina, except that this one's red, so it came from the donor progenitor cell, um, which is pretty remarkable how normal that looks. And see how it spans the entire retina. So these cells are able to position themselves anywhere in the retina they want, from one end to the other. OK, so there are still some challenges. And uh, we want to improve on our delivery. We want to increase the efficiency of the engraftment. We don't want to lose so many cells when we transplant. We want to improve the organization of the graft, especially in cases where the retinas degenerated quite a bit. And so the cells don't have such a nice template in order to instruct them as to what they should do. And so 
here's my little joke for the evening. Uh, I think the answer is going to be tissue engineering, and that's one of the things we're pursuing. And I'll show you some examples of why we're excited about this. So to do tissue engineering, you've got to be friends with the uh, chemical engineers at your facility. These are the geniuses that know how to make these fancy biological compounds. They basically take biological byproduct molecules that normally float through your body like lactic acid. Everybody who's run a 100-yard dash knows what lactic acid is. Well, you can actually make a sheet with the consistency of a, of a Dorito out of lactic acid if you know how to do it. So this substance that's really normally just a liquid can actually be precipitated out into a polymer. And what's really great about this kind of biopolymer is and because it's biological, when you put it into the tissue, it slowly dissolves, goes away, and turns into molecules that are normally present in the body anyway. Well, that's great because, you know, we wouldn't want to have some kind of toxic plastic or something in there uh, giving us all kinds of other problems. Um, so one uh, of these compounds that's very popular is known as PLGA, and that's the example I show here. This can be fabricated into these thin sheets, we call them scaffolds, that we're going to seed the cells onto. By the way you make it, you can actually have these channels into the polymer, and this provides a little niche that the stem cells can crawl into. So in the lower right, let's see here, you see these stem cells are sitting on top of this polymer. They also crawl down into these holes, although you can't see it here. And this gives you an example of how well these cells like to grow on the polymer. They could be growing anywhere in this dish, but they're adhering very readily to the polymer itself. So they like this stuff, and so do we. So here's an example of this kind of material being put under the retina using the type of surgical technique that's used in a human for a retinal detachment. Uh, a small hole is made in the retina, and the, the sheet is ex extended through there. Here you see the sheet under the retina of the pig afterwards. And here's a histological section showing what happened. The cells are in the sheet. This dotted line on either side shows you the extent of the polymer. And you can see that the cells, instead of migrating through the retina like you saw in the cat, they've actually stayed in the polymer. And they're also oriented. Remember those holes in the polymer? They're, they're like oriented in these grooves in the, in the polymer. So this polymer has imparted on the graft a structure that we couldn't have got if we just injected the cells in. Had we just put the cells here, they would have wandered off willy-nilly into the retina. But now they're staying put right at the level where we want to replace the photoreceptors. There's also indications that they have an orientation. They're aligned in the right direction to be a photoreceptor, and they have this what looks like an ending where they could synapse with the normal host retina. So things are starting to look a lot better this way. We'd like to have a much denser seeding of this material. We want a lot more photoreceptors because photoreceptors are like the pixels on your screen. The more you have, the better you're going to see. But uh, this, is, this was a very uh, kind of heartening result to get us moving in this direction. Now one problem, I'll just uh, back up here. One problem was that this PLGA was not so biocompatible in the subretinal space. So although this stuff breaks down into lactic acid and glycolic acid, which is okay if it's in your bone somewhere or, or in your muscle, which is used to dealing with that, the subretinal space is a very special microenvironment, very delicate. And it didn't like having all this acid dumped there, even if it's an organic acid. It's like, we don't want any acid around here. And actually, it just kind of triggered a, a foreign body response. All these immune cells kind of came swarming in to try and get rid of this stuff, just like if you had a, a sea urchin spine stuck in your foot like I did once. You know, those cells just want to get that stuff out of there. Um, so we had to come up with a different plan what to use. So back to the drawing boards, um, our colleagues at the Draper Lab uh, came up with this nano-structured surface. Uh, that's Dr. Sarah Tao. She calls this uh, short nanowire. 
Um, and wire, you look at this, it looks kind of bristly, and the wire sounds very kind of irritating. Um, but you've got to remember these are nano wires. These are so small that the cells sit on this, and it feels like a, a plush pile carpeting. It's just very smooth and soft, and just these little feathers waving at them. They love it. Um, and the other thing is that the tissue likes it too, as you'll see. So here's a piece of nanowire scaffold stuck under the retina of the pig. And this material is much more flexible and easier to work with. Remember, the PLGA was kind of like a Dorito chip. Well, the surgeons didn't really like us for that because they found it very difficult to position a Dorito chip in the back of the eye. But this is flexible and floppy, just like a piece of latex. So you can easily get it under the retina. You can roll it up. You can do whatever. Um, and here is an example of how the eye reacted to this. Instead of having this swarm of cells coming in there trying to get rid of it, everything is quiet as can be. Now, this is the retina of the pig up here, and this is a normal-looking retina. Ignore this giant gap here. This is just a histological artifact. So when you put this eye in formaldehyde, the retina just pops off. Sorry. <laughs> But imagine what this looked like in the living animal. This retina was right sitting here. And what you see right between this, this very clear looking structure, that's the nanowire polymer down here. So down below it's the pigmented layer, the RPE. And below that's Brooks membrane. Up above are the photoreceptors. And what's amazing about this is everything looks normal except that there's this sheet in there. Um, if you put PLGA in here, the retina would literally start to melt on top of it, which shows you how sensitive the retina is to foreign material. So we're really happy when we find something that's very benign like this. And we think this has the potential for doing things like repairing Brooks membrane. Remember in age-related macular degeneration, particularly the wet version, you can have these breaks in Brooks membrane, and that's where the whole problem comes from in the first place. So we're thinking materials like this uh, could potentially repair that. So you see that the polymer itself is well tolerated. Well, everything comes in stages. So the next thing we have to do is grow the cells on the polymer, and we're doing that here. This is what nanowire looks like at a, a regular level of a, a, a lab microscope, not the electron microscope. And then with the cells on top of it, you see they're kind of clumping on top of the carpet, as it were. Um, but they're growing there quite well, and they just sit on top of those little nanowires as happy as they can be. So the next stage is to transplant the, the polymer with the cells on it into the retina and see what happens then. And we're in the process of that. So now we get to the human retinal progenitors. So this is what you've really been waiting for. So after all this proof of principle in animals, moving up from rodents to pigs and so on, uh, we get to the point where we want to ask the question, well, does this apply to human beings? Is this going to be useful or just some kind of long-winded exercise? So here you see that retinal progenitor cells can actually be grown from human retinal tissue. Um, I started this work uh, at when I was at Children's Hospital of Orange County. You know, um, you've all, you know there's premature infants, and when an infant is too premature, uh, and their lungs haven't fully developed, that that's not a viable situation. And unfortunately, when a premature infant is born too early, there's really nothing you can do. They're just unable to breathe. And that means they, they pass away very quickly. Well, in some cases, the patient, uh, parents were gracious enough to donate some of this tissue, and we were able to actually grow living retinal progenitor cells um, at various time points after death um, from this tissue. Um, and we started to analyze these using all the molecular techniques we used on the other cells. And sure enough, these have the same kind of signature as the other retinal progenitor cells. Maybe a little more complicated, but what do you expect from a human? Now, there has been some human retinal progenitor transplantation. I'm going to divide this into two parts. One is transplantation into animals. Um, because you can't transplant into a human in the lab, go back to our old standby, the mouse. Now, you can get mice that are immunocompromised. 
So these are mice that just don't have an immune system. They're like the bubble boy. They have no immune system. And so into those mice, you can put the human retinal progenitor cells, and they're not going to be rejected. And you can say, well, what do they do? Well, they engraft in the right place to be photoreceptors. They're the green cells here. And they're expressing this red. That's the rhodopsin. That's the rod photoreceptor protein that actually catches the light. So these progenitor cells are no longer progenitor cells. They're turning into rod photoreceptors. So that's great. Um, so we think these cells are going to really do the same kinds of things in people that we saw when we did the animal experiments. Uh, meanwhile, there are groups in China that are actually putting similar cells into patients. And so we've talked to them to get their feedback on what they're seeing. And we're really interested, for instance, um, what's the deal with immune suppression? And uh, what was exciting to me is that these cells could survive without immune suppression. Now, the story's a little complicated because the patients were immune suppressed for the first couple days. But after that, no more immune suppression and no, no rejection of the cells. You could see them. These cells were put right in the jelly of the eye, so that's why you can see them like that. But with them sitting there, they could look at them at different time points after the surgery and say, yep, the cells are still there, and there's no big immune uh, catastrophe going on. So all in all, what I'm saying is this early work with human cells is stacking up right along the lines I would have predicted based on the animal work, and that's very heartening because this is, this is really where the action's at. Um, and if we're trying to rebuild the circuits of the eye, this may be a fruitful approach, but it may take a while to convince the FDA that we're rebuilding circuits in humans. You know, we're going to have to go back to the animals and stick all these electrodes in there and really prove that it's recreating the circuit and all this stuff. Meanwhile, people are going blind, and, you know, that's frustrating. So is there a shorter way to get this into the clinic? And one answer is to use the cells as a strategy to neuroprotect the photoreceptors instead of saying, oh, we're, we're going for the gold, we've got to replace them or nothing. Instead, what if we just keep them from degenerating in the first place? Well, it turns out that stem cells have a lot of neuroprotective qualities. Um, one is they can turn into rods, and rods can keep the cones alive. Remember in retinitis pigmentosa, once the rods died, the cones got really lonely, and then they kicked off too. If we can just replace the rods, whether they're functioning or not, if they just keep the cones happy, that's good enough, you know, because then you've blocked this stage here. It's not perfect, but wouldn't you rather be here than here? So this is what happens is the rods in the first cones are dying off, but if we can just keep those residual cones alive with our transplant, you know, that's going to be a great first step. So that's really our initial goal is to try and uh, spare some patients with RP from going from here to here. At the same time, I'm thinking these cells probably will replace some photoreceptors, but, you know, we don't want to have to qualify it uh, at that level from the get-go if we don't have to. Um, and the other thing is that these, um, the stem cells themselves, what I'm calling the retinal progenitor, they make certain growth factors, and these growth factors are like drugs. They act on the photoreceptors and are very powerful at keeping them alive. Very powerful. Why isn't this a drug already? It's because these growth factors are proteins. And just like the steak you had for dinner, it gets digested the moment it's in the body. So you need a way to continuously supply this stuff. The other factor is that if you buy this stuff over the counter, it's like hundreds of dollars for a few micrograms. So, you know, you'll go broke very quickly. So our idea is that the retinal progenitor cells, which we know can make these, this compound, put them in there and let them just keep delivering this stuff since they make it anyway. And if that doesn't work, we can use genetic engineering to boost the levels of the GDNF and then put the cells in. Of course, that's going to take a little more regulatory uh, oversight. But I'm going to show you something like that. So here's our work using ret retinal progenitor cells from human 
and transferring this growth factor gene into the cells using genetic engineering. Um, and I won't bore you with the details, but the green indicates that this growth factor is now being expressed by some of these cells. So we are getting the growth factor gene into the cells, and they are expressing it, and, and they're doing it in a sustained manner because these are different time points. And here's just an example showing at the protein level, we're also seeing that the actual growth factor is being made by the cells and that it's sustained at different time points. So we just want to purify these cells. Then we have to show that these cells are reliable and they're safe, and then they might be uh, worth transplanting. And here's a summary slide just to give you an idea where these retinal progenitors fit in with the other stem cell types. Um, you know, you could transplant the embryonic stem cell, or you could transplant the retinal progenitor cell, or you could try and use um, some of these other cells that people think have stem cell potential. So what is it you're really doing here? Why, why am I picking the retinal progenitor? And I'll tell you why. Because this is the cell that normally makes the rod photoreceptor. So all these other cell types first have to go through this stage and then get transplanted. You can't just transplant an embryonic stem cell into the eye. It'll make a tumor. You have to differentiate it into a retinal progenitor to restrict its ability to divide and then transplant it. And then it makes the cells you want and stops dividing. Um, these other cells, again, you need to turn them into something that's going to generate the right cell type. So this is the one cell that not only can be expanded up to a point in the laboratory, which means you can make a therapeutic agent out of it, but it's also something that you can transplant directly to the patient without a lot of other modification. So it may not be the perfect solution, but it's the simplest solution, and that makes it attractive as the first solution. And that's why we're going this way first. And then you know about the targeted diseases. That's what I talked about. We're really aiming at uh, retinal degenerations as the first stop, particularly retinitis pigmentosa. And then hopefully that will overlap and have application in age-related macular degeneration. We think this strategy will also be useful in retinal detachment, not to attach the retina. Surgeons can already do that. But to replace the photoreceptors that die when the retina is detached. Um, and we think it will have application to optic nerve degenerations, particularly in terms of delivering the GDNF, the growth factor, that can preserve those nerve cells. And it really does do that. Um, and here's some of the people I collaborate with. This work was the work of many, many people at various institutions around the world. And uh, I want to give special thanks to my uh, industrious laboratory. Thank you very much.